In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Okay. I would recommend the parents um, to look at the parents' essay in your material. Um, it kind of summarizes some of what I'll be talking about. So we st we're talking about God who is Father Almighty and, our f and what is um, a hint of what is faith and what we believe. So there's, very, there's ways of coming into the faith can be done by coming to a knowledge that we have, seeing the world, its beauty, and its order. Well, except if, if you exclude humans, it's very orderly. That wasn't good, was it? Okay. So the world in the, in it, with its order and its beauty and the universe. And it's amazing how everything seems to work properly. And it also, it, so you look, at the, you look at beauty, look at the foliage right now. That doesn't, I don't believe that happens accidentally. St. Paul, he said this. For what can we know about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in things that have been made. So he's talking about the creation of the world and what we have in front of us, and he's basically saying that this stuff didn't happen by an accident. And I think if we become really serious about this, you 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 got to understand that that seems to be true. I make reference to a cousin of mine. Um, he is he is deceased. However, when he was alive, he was an amazing physicist. And he also claimed to be an atheist. And I saw him a few years after I had seen him before. And I asked him one day, I said, Mike, are you still an atheist? And he said, no. I said, what changed your mind? He said, according to the laws of physics, they all crumble. He says, at a certain point in physics, it doesn't add up. And he said, in my in my understanding as a physicist, he said, the only thing that's holding things together is someone who is orchestrating things to benefit creation for the purpose of taking care of humanity. This is a guy who was a scientist. Okay? And there are other, there are other stories, if you've, if you've looked at books, if you look at certain books about creation and everything, you can find articles and people saying things like that. There's another ex interesting example. There's, there's a, uh, you, if you Google something called, um, uh, I just forgot it. Um, I'll come back to it. Never mind. Okay. Um, the human person with an openness to truth and beauty, begins to sense moral goodness. Isn't that true about us? Even if our mor uh, morals are a little skewed, we want morals. If we've been brought up improperly, we want morals that are selfish, but you want morals. Okay? 
a sense of morals and moral goodness, freedom, and a voice of conscience is in us. And if you're, if you're a human being who's not asleep, so to speak, okay, your conscience happens in you, doesn't it? There have been times when in your gut you were like, yeah, I know I shouldn't be doing this, or I know that's the right thing to do. These longings for infinite happiness are there for us. And that's what they are. Man questions himself about God's existence. But in all things, he discerns signs of his spiritual soul. In other words, there's something more to us than a body. There's the, there's the, the ray of light inside of us, which we would call our soul. The soul drives our vocation. The soul is given to us by God, and it's the non-physical part of who we are. It's the spiritual being of us, okay? So someday, if you go to heaven, your body is going to be sort of let go for a while until the resurrection of the dead, and your soul will stand there free. Your soul goes to heaven while waiting for the reunion to the body. Man by nature has a vocation as a religious being. There's, in, in, across the world, in all cultures, there's some kind of longing to contact a deity. Man is made to live in communion with God in whom he finds happiness. And this is there for us, and we sense it. This is exactly what Adam and Eve were feeling before the fall, and they mixed things up a little bit for us. So we're in recovery. We look at human reason when we're talking about ways of knowing God, okay? The church teaches our Creator and Lord can be known with certainty by natural light of human reason. Mo- most of the stuff I'm reading from, uh, I'm getting from the catechism, by the way. Okay. Human reason sets us apart from all the creatures of the earth. That's what's different about us and the rest of created things. Has anybody seen pictures of the Sistine Chapel, the artwork? In one of those pictures, you'll find Jesus... Uh, Adam is on a cloud, and he's reaching out with kind of a limp hand, and you see God with a very forceful finger trying to touch Adam, and they're about to, okay? Now, what's interesting is Adam seems to be like on a cloud, and the background of of God that's reaching out to Adam, it has a funny look to it, and if you pay attention, it looks exactly like the half of a brain, Michelangelo did that with intent. It is his portrait of man receiving reason from God, the gift of being, of having an intellect and being reasonable. Believers know that the love of Christ urges them to bring the light of the living God to those who do not know him or they reject him. In other words, we, have this, we want this propensity to actually share what we're understanding about our faith, but sometimes we don't feel equipped to do it, do we? Or we're afraid to, or we don't think we can do it. However, somewhere along the lines, we, d- we can communicate even with our living example and experience. Another thing that we come to here, if God is the Almighty, something we call the obedience of faith. The obedience of faith is to submit freely to the word of God that has been heard. Okay? In other words, the obedience of faith means what I I understand in the commandments, what I get from the teachings of the church, 
what I get from receiving scripture, all those things take priority over my opinion. So in other words, the obedience of faith means I trust God so much that even if what he says looks crazy, I'm going with that. Okay, right now we live in a culture where, here's a good example. We live in a culture like this. You would be crazy if you didn't want to abort a child who you don't want. That's stupid. Why not get rid of it? But this is where we are. Because we've become unreasonable. And we've dropped out, out, we dropped out of the schema of God and his plan for us. Abraham is one of the first biblical champions of, the tr- of being obedient to the faith. He's a model for that obedience. Abraham gets a phone call, a cell phone call from God, and he says, we, we're going to move you. Take everything with you. You're going to a new land because I'm starting humanity over again and I want the competent people to do it and you're going to help me. Yes, Lord. Okay. And so you know, we know that Abraham went to another land, but why did he do that? What was behind that? It wasn't God just whispering in his ear. He was in a culture that was barbaric and they were worshiping false gods. And by the way, There's really no such thing as a false god. There's either God and his angelic chorus and the saints, or there's a devil. And so Abraham, you could say, was in the midst of a culture of evil. And God saw something in him that he knew he could salvage, and he could salvage this guy's life and family and start a new life and a new living and showing them what is truthful. The letter to the Hebrews says it like this. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. Abraham didn't see God, but he sure heard him. And he made a difference in the world, beginning there, even following to what we are living now. Abraham believed in God, and it was reckoned to to him as righteousness. In other words, he was right with God because he trusted God and he led him. Strong in his faith, Abraham becomes what we know as the father of all who believe or the father of our faith. Another great example of this obedience of faith, of course, is, anybody want to take a guess? Who said the Blessed Virgin Mary? You're right. She's the most perfect embodiment of the obedience of faith because she believed that what God said was not impossible, but possible by his grace. She believed what God said without questioning. And and if you go back into the scene here, okay, remember, she may have been called insufficient, you could say, because she was pregnant, but they weren't quite married yet, maybe, okay? So there's a lot of ifs going on there, but she held fast just the same. And she says to God when, he appe- when the angel appears to her, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. Not mine. I get this, and I'm going to follow you. Faith, then, is a supernatural gift from God to sustain us in in the belief necessary for interior help from the Holy Spirit. And faith is necessary for salvation. The Lord himself affirms that he who believes and is baptized will be saved. And this is one of the things that we need to look at here is that our faith calls us to baptism. And so it's right for us to bring our children to baptism so that they can be saved. It's very clear. He who does not believe will be condemned, St. Mark says in Mark 16, 16. What if I struggle with my faith, Father? Well, one of the church fathers says, 
to that. Faith seeks understanding. And so what I would say to you is, if you're having trouble with faith, start investigating. Find counsel that you can trust. Start looking at the scriptures and understand that the scriptures are are the truth from God who's giving us all kinds of hints. At the very least, again, one of my, I, I say this often, the Ten Commandments to me are the best template of life. You just can't refute that stuff. And when we live by them, it's amazing how well a society functions. No wonder we're in such a bad way when paper places all over the country had lists of the Ten Commandments on granite removed. Okay? However, we believe, don't we? Okay? To believe in one God, the Father Almighty, and the Holy Spirit, that's the Trinity. The church is the mother, then, of all believers. It's in, it's in the church that we are mothered and nurtured through the sacraments, especially. The church is the mother of all believers. Who held the most precious sacrament first? The Blessed Virgin Mary. She held the sacrament of God, Jesus Christ. That's what she held. And with her intercession, she helps us to be held by the church. No one can have God as father who does not have the church as their mother. That which the church proposes for belief as is divinely revealed. Let's look at the creed then. Have you noticed that there are two creeds? Who knew that? Okay. Most of the time we use the Apostles' Creed. I'm, I'm sorry, the Nicene Creed. We'll get to that in a minute. The Apostles' Creed is considered a brief faith summary of the dictates of what it is to be a proper Catholic and disciple of Christ. It is the ancient baptismal symbol of the Church of Rome. What does that mean? In other words, the creed stands for and gives testimony to the need for baptism and the need to be united with Christ and the united with Christ in the church. It's great authority the, that the, the Apostles' Creed comes from the ancient Roman church and it was the testimony point of St. Peter's what we call charisma. A kerygma is a basic outline of a te- or a template of, a su- of the series of beliefs. And this is what the Apostles' Creed does. It's, it's in its most basic form. And you can find forms of that that are akin to the Apostles' Creed in the Acts of the Apostles, in, in the, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, and Paul's letter to the Romans. You can see that ancient tread. Now, the Nicene Creed comes, to, comes into reality because... At some point after the apostles all died off, um, people were getting mixed up. Some of the leadership was a little bit compromised, and they started getting mixed up about the truths of the apostles' creed. And so the church fathers in uh, 325 put together something that was called the Council of Nicaea, where they worked out a lot of things that were even in error about what people were believing. And the Nicene Creed became the outline of what was proper in the framework of belief for Christianity. So you hear things like um, in the Nicene Creed, consubstantial with the Father. Do you remember that phrase? Consubstantial with the Father. In other words, we're united with God by what we call substance, okay? Substance means, let's put it this way, break down a little philosophy. Substance is the whatness of who you are, <laughs> if I can describe that. So, a su- so for example, 
you have a table. You're all at round tables, correct? Or most of you. So you're at a round table, and so what you're, but however, you might be sitting at a rectangular table. Okay? And we understand that the table is recognizable because we understand the substance of what the table is, of what a table is. Okay? And so that means that that's a kind of something. Okay? So I, I, I adopted the term myself. It's the whatness. The table is a whatness. Now, its shape is, in philosophy, is what we call the accidents. All right? The accidents means what kind of shape does it take? What kind of form does it have? What kind of color? So it's the physical things we see. But what we know as table is not necessarily seeing. So I can close my eyes and imagine a table, and I'm not, I'm not seeing it. Do you understand? Am I getting too complicated? Okay. And so, so we share the substance with God. Not just to look like when it says, when it says God made us in his image, it's not just what we look like. If that was true, then God would look like Father Mo. Or worse, he might look like Doug. Okay? But but that's not but that's not what it is. It's the substance of who we are in the nature of God. Okay. So they straightened out a lot of things that were causing uh, trouble in the church, and one of those things was what they call the um, Arian crisis. Anybody remember, know anything about that? The, Ar- the, Arians, the Arians were people who said that Jesus wasn't really God. He didn't have godliness. He was just, he, he was, he, he was just not really God. He might, he might have th- said he was, but he wasn't. Anyways, an argument developed in the church, and w- bishops went to war against each other over this stuff. And so they had to straighten it out, and guess who won? It wasn't the Arians. Okay? And there's a little anecdote that goes with that, that um, St. Nicholas was one of the big players in this argument. And it's, it may be true or not true, it was uh, in... Um, in a debate, St. Nicholas got up and the um, leader of the Arians, he got up and he punched him in the mouth. It, they were so upset about all this. So, okay. Our profession of faith begins with God then. Our profession of faith has an understanding that we have a creed that gives us a template for understanding God as Father. The Father is the first divine person in the most holy trinity. And so we can call him our Father because we are his dear children. The creed begins with the creation of heaven and earth. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Why, is that come, why, is, why do we say that in that sequence? Because God is responsible for creation. Not the Big Bang Theory, although he might have used the Big Bang Theory. Okay? Creation is the beginning and the foundation of all God's work. That's what he started with. Sometimes I imagine this. It looks to me like the universe was a perfect terrarium that God built to take care of us and to make us happy. Okay? Okay? Not to, I, I'm not to, re, to, to confuse terrarium with just animals, okay? You, you understand the imagery. Okay. The faithful first professed their belief in one God. And so this becomes monotheism. It's what Abraham discovered. Maybe not totally clear, but he discovered that they, he understood that there was only one God. Everything else is not a God and it's from someplace else, and we need to understand that. Okay? So we have to be careful. Think right now, witches, seances, Ouija boards, these are all toys of the evil one. Okay? I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. This is, this is all involving ourselves with false deities that are really demonic. If you have a Ouija board, by the way, break it, and throw it away. 
Okay? Anything else that purports to be God, in fact, is demonic. And so we believe in one God. To Israel, his chosen people, God revealed himself as the only one. Hear, O Israel, he says, the Lord your God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Jesus makes it clear that he himself also is the Lord. In other words, because of the Trinity, he is in union, right, with the Father and the Holy Spirit. So confessing that Jesus is Lord is distinctive of Christian faith, right? Jesus, he makes us distinguished as holding our Christian faith, which separates us, for example, from, say, the, the, from Islam or Mohammedism. It separates from that, and even Jews. We have a component that they are missing. It's not contrary to believe, this is not contrary to belief in one God, nor does believing in the Holy Spirit as Lord, who is the giver of life. Okay? So in other words, we know there's not three gods. There's one God, but he manifests himself in three persons. The three persons indeed, but one substance, or one of the words that they use in the catechism is essence. St. Thomas Aquinas uh, probably went more with the word substance. Okay? But, so three persons, but one essence or substance. Now God reveals his name. He makes his name known to the people of Israel, beginning with Moses. God has a name. This is very interesting. God has a name, okay? He is not an anonymous force. He is Elohim, Adonai. He is Yahweh. He has a name. Why? Because he wants to disclose himself to us. To disclose one's name is to make oneself known and accessible. In other words, he, by giving us his name, beginning with Moses, gave Moses access to consult with him, to listen to him, and to be led by him, and to be attentive even to, his pro- to Moses' problems. One of, the fa- one of the most often cried out things is they go to Moses, but we don't like manna. So Moses gets on, his, takes out his cell phone, and he says, hey, Lord, we got a problem here. Okay. Can you fix this? And good, the manna comes out of the sky. Can you believe it? To know a person's name implies also a power over the one named. This, this is according to Hebrew tradition. If you know somebody's name, you had a power or an authority by them. So it's kind of like this. You, you see somebody you don't know and you don't know how to get their attention. And so you're like, uh, excuse me, you, but they, they don't turn around because they don't think that it's you, you mean them. However, when you know their name, you can say, that's me. That's you. That's Ro- Rob, Rob, Rob. Do I have your attention? There, See? I just had power over him because I made him talk. (laughs) Yes, but a kind and beneficent one. I say that in all humility, of course. Okay, so to know someone's name is to have power. In other words, God is allowing us to have a, a, a type of power over him. All right? However, if you're as parents, okay, your, your kids can only go so far with exercising that power, now can't they? Because there are also prudential limits, okay? And you can see that Moses doesn't always get what he wants. Why? Because God knows better. And it's the same way in the way we conduct, conduct our family lives. But God gave us his name to call upon. One of my favorite quotes from St. John Vianney is this. 
Some, somebody asked him, he said, he, he, he said to him, how do you know, how do you know God so well? And John Vianney said to this guy, he said, are you kidding? I'm ask, asking, ask, uh, I'm adding a little bit of flavor to this. He said, are you kidding? He said, at the Holy Mass, at the consecration, I call him to come down and he comes. And he's there. And he says, I can give him to you. Okay? So when you know somebody's name, it implies that power. But it's all, it, in, when God does it, it's a power of love. And that's how it should be with us as well. To know intimately and address personally. The power to know him intimately and address him personally. When you start really getting into a good prayer life and reading scripture, you're going to get to know more intimately who God is, especially through Jesus and the Gospels. You're going to know. You're going to see things that you read in the Gospels and you're going to say, that's, that's Jesus. And you're going to find yourself, you're going to find yourself taking on some of those things and guess what? There's your Jesus. As St. Paul would say, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Because of your baptism, you are born again and you have put on Christ, as St. Paul says. Christ lives in me. And, And you could go so far as to say, I'm Jesus. You could go far as so far as to say that because Christ is in you. Because everybody you encounter should see Christ. To know intimately and uh, be a, an address personally, calling God Abba, Father. Abba is an ancient word from the Hebrews that meant Father or even better, Daddy. There's that intimacy there. To Moses, God declares himself, I am who am. That sounds really strange. I am who am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent you to me. This is my name forever. And thus, I am to be remembered throughout all generations. In other words, I am who am means God's always been and he always will be. There's no timeline for him. He is eternal. He's always been And he always will be. And this is what Moses came to understand. And it's something that we should take seriously. Or like my cousin who came to the understanding that someone is running the whole show. And it has nothing to do with physics. It has everything to do with love. The divine name is mysterious then the divine name of God. And God who reveals himself as the I am, he is and who was and who is to come. There's an interest, just one little interesting thing of uh, physics. Some of the laws of physics I I remember back in in high school, but the one that stands out the most is... um, Nothing... Uh, wait a minute. Um, it'll come in a second. Um, yes. Nothing can be moved without a force to move it. Nothing can be moved without a force to move it. Where did that come from? Where did the force come from? It, where did that happen? Okay. And so uh, Aristotle would say that's the prime mover. He kicked everything into gear. However, there's another, uh, another law of physics. Created matter, uh, matter cannot be created or destroyed. Does anybody remember that one? Matter, matter cannot be created nor destroyed. Well, that's a puzzle because where did everything come from then? If it can't be created or destroyed, where did it come from? 
unless you can answer that question, you have to believe in God. Okay? Finally, faced with God's fascination and mystery and presence, man can discover first his own insignificance. Why do I say that? When we realize how almighty God is, we become humble. And it's the humble that God cherishes the most. Because you know why? It's, it's like your, 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 your children sometimes. They get humble and you don't have to deal with them. They don't require a lot of attention. They don't disturb things because they're humble. And so God loves that. That it's not that he doesn't want to be disturbed, but it's, it reveals the fact that in humility, we know who we are and we know how much he, we don't deserve him. But we know that he wants to give us everything he can to give us abundant life. And so in God's presence, we discover our insignificance, but the grandeur of God who loves us and has adopted us as his dear children in grace and mercy. Amen.